Look, I'm very concerned that we have whole areas of our towns and cities that are unrecognisable as being English. They closed their borders largely. Do you think Britain should do the same? Pretty much. This issue of the population, of who's coming, who's coming legally or illegally, this is going to be what decides British politics at the next general election. I have no doubt about that. Can Trump ever be safe from assassination? No, I'm afraid not. His safe spaces were Mar-a-Lago and the golf club, and that's where he spends most of his time. And it's proved not to be safe. And I can't even imagine what's going through his mind. To a much lesser degree, when I announced that I was going to run in a general election, the first day I was in Clacton and a woman ran up and threw a milkshake in my face. Two days later, I was in Barnsley and some yob threw a, you know, a cup full of cement at the bus. I got to tell you, I wake up the next morning thinking, can I go on campaigning? Can I actually go on going out? doesn't matter how much security you have around you. If you're actually going out to meet people, the risk of these things is always there. Now, you know, I did carry on. I adapted ever so slightly what I was doing. Uh, but I can't even imagine. You know, you've been shot at, survived miraculously with that turn of the head. And now this. And the guy was only 400 yards away, hiding in the bushes. If he hadn't been spotted, he'd have shot him from less than 50 yards. So what on earth do you do if you're him? And what effect does that have on your confidence? I, I have to say, I, I feel, I mean, it's truly awful what's happened. And it's going to be very, he's a strong guy. There's no question about that. Uh, but goodness me, this just makes life so difficult. I know that you've had several near-death experiences and threats to your own life. And did that sort of change? How did that change you, for example, that plane crash in 2010? Well, I mean, the plane crash is something I should probably never have survived. And I was horribly smashed up. But all I felt after that was relief. It's a miracle. I'm alive. Yeah, I'm a bit damaged. I had to have operations and things afterwards. But, but So I've, I've never suffered any problems with that because I feel, wow, I'm lucky. Oh, and by the way, I'm never going in a single engine light aircraft ever again. But what he's going through is different. Because literally, if he walks out of his front door, how does he know that he's safe? It's, it's truly horrible. I, I have to say that the narrative uh, that is put out by the liberal left against conservative figures is frankly insightful. And I don't want to say too much, but what I will say is that my security situation has changed significantly since the general election, significantly. And that's as, as a result of the riots and left and right commentators, conservatives, Labour, um, say, you know, saying that I was inciting the riots as if somehow, you know, I was linked with the Tommy Robinson wing of politics. So, so and, and I genuinely believe in my case that what's been said by some national broadcasters literally is insightful. Well, here, it's a whole lot worse than that. In Britain, we've heard endless talk of the threat from the far right. Do you think that the elites understand that actually the threat from the far left is building and is serious? No, I don't think they do fully. Uh, I mean, I think what they do understand, um, and electorally Labour are now terrified of many of the inner cities. You know, remember, where Streeting only held his seat against, you know, a pro-Gaza candidate by simply a few hundred votes. So I think they're aware of that threat, electoral threat to them, the sort of the sectarianisation of politics. But I, I, I don't think they understand uh, some of the real hatreds that are building up on the left towards anybody uh, who, who expresses even a vaguely conservative view. Now, look, you know, we talk about the threat from the far right. Of course, it exists. You know, we know there are people out there uh, that love violence. Um, uh, but I, I don't think that, I mean, I honestly don't believe the far right's very big in Britain. I don't think most of those people out on demonstrations were members of the far right. They were just enraged people who are really, really worried about what's happening in our towns and cities. We'll get on to that. I want to stick with America first. Kamala Harris has been described as a communist by Trump. Do you agree with him? Well, I mean, look, you know, the Donald uses very colourful language. Um, Whether well, communist is quite right, but there's certainly a strain of Marxism running through there somewhere. Do you think she's a diversity hire? 
Well, Joe Biden said before she was even selected that that was what he was going to pick. He was going to pick a woman. Um, and if he, and, uh, you know, if it could be a woman of colour, even better. Um, hey, we've seen this all through the corporate world as well. It isn't just, it isn't just politics. You know, all the big American firms have gone crazy on this diversity agenda. Um, and so you finish up with people getting jobs and positions based not on ability. Um, but I think the pendulum's coming back. I think, you know, you take ESG investing. Suddenly you're seeing lots of the big funds saying, you know what? We're not going to invest our people's money on the basis of whether it seemed to be ethically good. We actually need we actually need to invest in firms that pay us dividends and we make profit. So I do sense, I do sense on this whole diversity stuff that there is something of a move back towards not quite yet meritocracy, but I think we're going in the right direction. Are Haitians eating pets in Ohio? So whenever Donald Trump says something that sounds outrageous and he gets widely mocked for it. It always turns out to be true. In the past, it always has turned out to be true. So, you know, I haven't been uh, around the towns of Ohio having a look, um, but there may be something in what he says. Do you think that immigration represents a major threat to Britain from a demographic perspective? So in the last 20 years, the white British population has declined from 87% to 74%. Um, is that a concern of yours? No. No, that's not a concern of mine. Uh, what is a concern? Uh, what is a concern of mine is, in many cases, the lack of integration. Uh, we see that writ large by the new kind of politics that's emerging, sectarian voting along religious lines. Uh, I never really thought I'd see that in England in my lifetime. I mean, I grew up seeing what it did in Northern Ireland, uh, and it's not very welcome. No, I think the real problem is this: that the population explosion and remind ourselves that it's 10 million increase since Blair came to power, 6 million increase since the Conservatives came to power in 2010, is having a negative effect on the lifestyles of pretty much everybody in the country, whether it is access to public services, whether it is the complete unaffordability or impossibility of young people to get on the housing ladder. I mean, just think about it. We need to build a new home every two minutes just to cope with the last two years' levels of legal, let alone illegal, legal net migration, uh, the impact the impact on, oh, I mean, everything, traffic, you name it. I mean, I mean, you know, our lives have been devalued. And now we learn, now we learn that even the one big reason why we were all told We've got to put up with this. We're beginning to learn that's not true either, namely the economy. Now, I remember in 2014 being interviewed by Nick Robinson on this subject. And he said, oh, yeah, but GDP goes up, you know, by something point of a percent every year because of because of migration. Uh, and I said in that interview, but actually, you know, GDP isn't everything. And I was met with sort of astonished look as if I'd said something that couldn't be said. Interesting, isn't it, that GDP per capita fell for the last six consecutive quarters of the Conservative government that was there until July, at the same time that net migration reached massive historic high levels. And now, you know, quite a few academic reports now coming out saying, actually, do you know what? Unskilled migration into Britain, far from being good for us, is actually over the long term costing us a great deal of money, making us poorer. And I think once that argument start, and it's just begun this debate, but once that argument starts to permeate, uh, then I think you're going to see some very big changes in public attitudes. I don't mean in a nasty way. I don't mean against communities or anything like that. But I mean the absolute demand that we just stop these massive numbers coming to Britain. And I, I don't think Labour even understand this. It's perfectly clear to me, you know, from these first couple of months in power, they don't really understand it. They don't really get it. They don't think it matters. They think the issue, they think the issue will go away. And of course, how can the Conservatives, whoever their new leader is, how can they talk about this credibly, given their record? You say you're not concerned about demographic changes in Britain, but we have seen the fastest and most rapid decline of the white British population ever experienced in British history. This has happened in such a tiny, short period of time. And I think some people, 
many, many people in Britain are concerned about that. Majority cities that were once, you know, 90% yeah. white British are now majority ethnic minority. Look oh. at London, Leicester, Birmingham. So why isn't that a concern of yours? Look, I'm very concerned that we have whole areas of our towns and cities that are unrecognisable as being English. But they're not unrecognisable as being English because of skin colour. They're unrecognisable because of culture. I mean, look, you know, the truth is, I genuinely think that the British are the most open-minded, most accepting people, <laughs> you know, that you'd frankly find, I think, from any Western country. But it's the cultural impact of this. It is, it is the societal impact of this. You know, you look at our cities now, you know, people often don't even, don't even know the names of their neighbours. It is the breakdown of communities. It's why kind of in the election campaign, I said, family, community, country, these are the things uh, that we're going to stand for in reform. So yes, of course, I'm deeply worried, but perhaps for different reasons than your question. If Britain is made up of a majority of immigrants and their descendants, is it the same country? Well, it's not the same country because you don't actually have anything in common. That's the problem, isn't it? That, 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 that part of who we are is shaped by our history, is shaped by our family experiences, is, sh is shaped by the triumphs and tragedies that the country's been through in the last 100, 150 years. It's part of who we are. Um, and if you finish up with large numbers of people uh, with whom you have nothing in common, well, clearly it's going to be a very different place. And, and, one, that, and one that's going to struggle to have a proper collective sense of what matters. Um, that's concerning. In Birmingham recently, we saw anti-white graffiti painted on a school. This was in an area which was more than 90% non-white British, um, ethnically diverse, mostly kind of Asian population. We've also seen examples of anti-white discrimination in the RAF and more recently in the police. These were court cases, you know, found that these people were discriminated against because of the colour of their skin. Is Britain becoming systemically racist against white people? <laughs> I think some of the institutions are. And the Royal Air Force, perhaps, is, is the best example of a lot. I mean, hey, surely you've got to pick people who are physically and technically the best people to be in the Royal Air Force. And, and I, I thought it's absolutely appalling what they've done. Um, no, look, uh, the problem is we're living in a two-tier country. Uh, you know, two-tier attitudes towards employment. Uh, two-tier attitudes towards policing. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, police officers taking the knee, um, dancing in the streets virtually. Um, you, you get a, you know, a rough crowd at a football game and, and the policing's very, very different. Uh, Two-tier justice, uh, you know, where people who say beastly things on Facebook might get two or three years in prison, uh, but others who commit really very serious offences get non-custodial sentences, like the guy that threw, like the guy that threw cement at me. Non-custodial. So what does it say? Just go and do it, you know. Um, 85 quid, the fine. I mean, you get more, you get a bigger fine for not paying the charge to cross the Dartford, the Dartford Bridge uh, than he got. So it, it's two-tier all the way through. And this is going to bite two-tier care. You watch. This is going to bite. And I think, I think that in the end, the sense of fair play and what is fair dealing is going to come through. And I sense that, do you know, I sense that Westminster, this parliament, I think is probably the least representative we've ever had. Remarkable, the, 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 the odd outcomes that the first past the post system can bring you. But I honestly don't think this parliament even understands where the debate is going in this country. In terms of the atmosphere in Britain, are you concerned that there is a rising level of anti-white hatred? Uh, I'm, I'm just concerned about a deeply divided society. Uh, I'm concerned about a society which they tell us that, they, they keep telling us the crime figures are improving. I think that's because people just don't bother to report crime anymore. People feel far less safe going out and about and I know, I've spoken to a number of women who live in London who just want to leave, who just genuinely don't feel safe on the tube at night. Um, people, people in the smart end of town, you know, who go out for dinner in the smart restaurants or hotels, you know, they go out without watches. Women go out without wearing jewellery. 
I mean, I'm talking here, you know, I'm talking about people who live in Chelsea and Kensington and they don't feel safe wearing a watch. Um, and you drive down Park Lane, one of the most expensive pieces of real estate in the country, uh, there's like an encampment there. So, you, you know, all you have to do is open your eyes to see, to see that we are living through societal decline. It's, it, 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 it frankly is a disaster. You talk about Park Lane and Mayfair and so on. I know that you've come under criticism recently for earning lots of money outside of your no. job in, in Parliament. Led by Donkeys, this campaign put up a, a billboard in your constituency, you know, sort of labelling how much money you've yeah. made. What do you make of these accusations that, you know, you're not a man of the people, you're mm. just one of those rich kind of Etonian types? I wonder whether they'll put a billboard up saying I'm taking zero personal expenses as an MP. I won't be taking any housing grants. I won't have my energy bills paid as everybody else does. I wonder whether they'll put a billboard up saying that. Um, you know, I get condemned for all these things. Well, as, I, as far as I know, we're supposed to work a 40-hour week, um, although I think Labour wants to have Fridays off now. Um, you know, the fact that I work 100 hours, <laughs> you know, and I'm a bit of a workaholic. Um, yeah, I, you know, also, also, I mean, th 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 this whole system of, of, of financial declarations doesn't suit someone running a company. You know, I do a variety of things. I have a number of staff that work for me. You know, some month, I mean, that particular month was a big month because I had three months worth of income coming into it. But look, I will be criticized whatever I do. I'll be criticized for earning money. I'll be criticized, if I'm in the House of Commons, I should be in Clacton. If I'm in Clacton, I should be in the House of Commons. I will get condemned for whatever I do. And you know what? I ignore the whole blooming lot. I couldn't care less. Coming back to the issue of migration, in the US, when they had a period of mass migration in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they closed their borders largely um, in the 1920s for, I think, almost three decades. Do you think Britain should do the same? Pretty much. I think we should aim for... Let's give net zero a different meaning. <laughs> Let's give... you know, I mean, people are always going to come and go. And we are a country that's engaged in international trade and we have relationships around the world through the Commonwealth, etc. Um, but yeah, we have to aim at a balanced migration policy. But net zero still means hundreds of thousands of people coming into Britain, immigrants coming into Britain. Isn't that too many? It, it, no, it may well be, but we have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. If we can get into people's minds that we have to try and stop this relentless rise in the population that's having, the, that's having a negative impact. That's where you start. And one thing we can't do is stop people leaving. And I have to say, I'm very worried about the numbers that are leaving. It isn't just the rich that are going to Dubai. It's the 30-somethings. It's the entrepreneurs. It's the people who put up or borrow risk capital what the government or Jeremy Hunt would call unearned income. <laughs> it's just unbelievable where we got to. And I'm worried that the entrepreneur class is leaving. And we haven't had this phenomenon since the late 1970s, you know, when the brain drain was a very real thing. A lot of very bright, young uh, graduates, you know, who would be going into law, accountancy, medicine. And in the late 70s, they were heading off for America, Australia, places like that in very large numbers. And that's beginning to happen again. And so I am, I'm pretty worried about the budget on the 30th of October. But I remind myself that it's Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor, who, as I say, talked about how bad unearned income is, who slashed the levels at which we have to start paying capital gains tax, uh, who began to demonise the non-doms. So all Labour are doing is just carrying on with the same policy. So I am worried about the calibre and quality of those that are leaving. Do you support mass deportations? Well, if people come illegally, they should not be allowed to stay. Simple as. Simple as. And the only way you're ever going to solve the channel, and boy, have a look at the last three days. You know, 500 odd um, on Friday, 800 on Saturday, nearly 300 yesterday. I mean, the numbers are, the numbers are just exploding you know, these young, of these young men that are coming. Um, and unless they know that, number one, they'll never be granted refugee status by coming via this route, that, number two, they're not going to stay, they'll keep coming.
It's dead simple. No matter what you do to the gangs, I mean, you could give it, you know, you, you could give these gang members life imprisonment, but the more people are going to step in to the gap because of the money involved. I mean, look, think about drugs. You know, however big a sentence is we give to drug dealers, there's always somebody else to come and fill that place. Um, but we'll never do this as part of the ECHR. We'll never, ever do this. All the while, all the while, the British judiciary can lean on the Human Rights Act, which incorporated the European Convention. We will never, ever deal with it. And I think this is going to become one of the big fault lines in British politics, major fault line in British politics. Starmer, I was there, Starmer in his second speech to the House of Commons talked about his belief in the European Court of Human Rights and how we would never leave. Uh, we are absolutely clear that this organisation that was set up with the best of intentions 70 years ago is no longer fit for purpose, is through activism, you know, has now moved into areas that it was never intended to do. And the Conservatives, it'll be just like Brexit. There'll be a few voices saying we should uh, consider leaving. You know, if we can't get what we need, we should consider leaving. But with the other lot who say, no, we should stay, they'll be all over the place. And it's going to be a very similar debate to Brexit. But just back to the issue of deportations specifically, <coughs> do you support that mass deportations? Trump says in America that he wants mass deportations. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants are in Britain at the moment. Some estimates say the number could even be in, you know, a million plus. So do you support deporting all of those people? It, it's impossible to do. Literally impossible to do. Um, but do we have to begin the process? Yes. Look, we're told that we can't send people back to Afghanistan, right? That's impossible. Well, Germany, two weeks ago, did. Germany sent a plane load of people back to Afghanistan. You know, if the Germans can do it, I'm certainly sure we can. But if the Americans can do it, for example, you know, in America, they, they are able to deport a lot of people. I know they haven't under this administration, but Trump was able to. It's not totally well, impossible, is it? I mean, no, it should be I mean, an ambition, mass, at least. Is it your ambition? The mass deportations in America really happened under Eisenhower, where back in the 50s, he deported over a million people who'd come to America illegally. Um, for us, at the moment, it's a political impossibility. But is it your ambition? No. no, no you know, I, I'm not going to get dragged down the route of, of mass deportations or anything like that. Um, I think it's pretty clear there are a lot of people that have come who should not be given leave to remain. It's a heck of a job. It's a heck of a job. I, 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 I just think with the backlogs, uh, with all the problems we've got, you know, we've got to go down the Tony Abbott route. We've got, you know, the Australian Prime Minister who stopped this. We've absolutely got to be clear. We won't accept this. We won't be, we, you know, we're not going to put people in hotels. Uh, we have to start somewhere. But these people who have come here, some of whom we don't know anything about, you know, one case, terrible case recently, we saw Thomas Roberts, a 21-year-old, um, you know, young British chap, being stabbed to death by someone who smuggled himself into the country in 2018. These people need to go, don't they? And by saying that you don't support de you know, mass deportations... If I say I support mass deportations, you know, that's all anybody will talk about for the next 20 years. So it's pointless even going there. So right. it's a rhetorical, it's a, rhetorical it's a, problem. It's a political impossibility to deport hundreds of thousands of people. We simply can't do it. What I do think is the reason, particularly in France, the reason that the reason that Le Pen is going to win the presidency in 27 is the French population are making a link between some of the people coming into France and crime. And we're not even having that debate yet. And the government are actually willfully withholding the figures from us, willfully withholding the figures. And it was bad under the Conservatives, but it's got worse under Labour. You, know, you can't even find out what groups have committed certain types of crime. And it's obvious that, that whilst loads of great people come to Britain, for the criminal gangs that want to come in, we're easy pickings. So I think, I, I, look, th this issue, this issue of the population, of who's coming, who's coming legally or illegally. This is going to be what decides British politics at the next general election. I have no doubt about that. Looking back on Brexit, was it worth it if it meant that we were encouraging people mass immigration from outside of the European Union, which is what <laughs> happened? Look, Bre Brexit was about being in control ourselves. And the Conservative government opted to lower the barriers to entry to ridiculous levels. 
And people like me said, and Migration Watch said, well, this will mean even bigger numbers coming to Britain uh, than it did pre-Brexit. This was a choice that was made by the Conservative government, deliberate choice that was made in Boris Johnson's time. And they should never be allowed to forget it because that is a complete betrayal, not just of the Brexit vote, but of the 80 seat majority in 2019. A majority incidentally that I helped them get, you know, so I feel pretty angry about it as well. I want to talk about Islam and Winston Churchill to, to end the interview. So we'll bring the two things together to begin with. A quote from Churchill, individual Muslims may uh, show splendid qualities. Thousands become the brave and loyal soldiers of the queen. All know how to die, but the influence of the religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. No stronger retrograde force exists in the world. Far from being moribund, Mohammedism is a militant and proselytizing faith. Do you agree with Mr. Churchill? Well, Churchill fought against Mohammedism. I mean, he charged with a lance at the Battle of Omdurman. and he could have died. You know, so he'd, he'd seen extremist Islam. He'd fought against it. And funny enough, when Hitler came to power, he was almost alone in the British establishment in saying, this guy's dangerous, when everybody else thought he was great. And, yeah, how we forget, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the press support for Hitler, etc. And because what Churchill saw in Nazism was the same kind of fanaticism he'd seen in Mohammedism. I am convinced that the vast majority of British Muslims are worried about the growth of radical Islam. It's not an argument you hear very often, but I believe it absolutely to be true. I'm very worried about the number of 18 to 24 year old young men who think jihad's acceptable. And I did talk about this over the course of the last few months. I'm deeply worried about that. And I, but I know, I know that the people that are really worried about that are the moderate, law-abiding, tax-paying, peace-abiding Muslim majority that live in our country. So I think we have to take a rather different approach to this. And it's interesting because, you know, my party chairman, Zia Youssef, you know, he, he is quite prepared to stand up and call this out. Um, so, yes, extremist Islam is a very, very dangerous, very retrograde force. And look what it's done, you know, since since uh, uh, Kabul fell, look at the way women are having to live in Iran. Uh, so these answers are all too obvious. Churchill was right about that. But I think if, I think if, we, if we sort of try and condemn the religion in its entirety, <clears throat> we're possibly building up enemies that we don't need to. Since October the 7th, we've seen hate marches in Britain. We've seen the rise of uh, lots of anti-Semitism, particularly <clears throat> from you know, a lot of Muslims, frankly. Um, how do we integrate these people into Britain? And if they don't share our values, if they are anti-Semitic, if they are radical in this way, support jihad, for example, should we try and encourage them to leave? Well, we have seen, we have seen quite a lot of hate directed at Jews coming from radical Islamists. We've also got lots of white people called Jocasta, who are very middle class, who seem to hate Jews now as well. It's quite extraordinary. If you look at those marches, there's an awful lot of middle-class white British people on those marches as well. I can't explain it. I, I, I literally can't explain it, but it's been going on for some time. Think about the comments that Ken Livingstone was making when he was mayor of London. I mean, there is something, there is something in the modern left that seems to hate Israel, not believe it has the right to exist. Um, I, I can't explain all these things. But if someone comes to Britain and they espouse mm. radical, disgusting views yeah. that we would find abhorrent, shouldn't we encourage them to leave? Oh, I think we should, but I doubt they will. Um, uh, I suspect that, you know, the fact that you have a social security system and all the rest of it uh, would discourage people from leaving. Look, I mean, I have no doubt that, you know, this is going to be a major struggle that we're going to face for decades to come. It is a major, major, major problem. And that's why we need... That's why we need the peace-loving Muslim majority on our side. We have to try. We really desperately have to try.
I want to ask about Winston Churchill. Recently in an interview with Tucker Carlson uh, and historian Daryl Cooper described him as the chief villain of World War II. Uh. He said that he was a warmonger. He was lazy. He was a drunk. He was someone who uh, basically collapsed the British Empire and caused all these terrible problems that we've seen in Britain today. Britain so-called lost the Second World War because of the terrible impact that, you know, the post-war um, sort of uh, the outcome of the post-war regime was on Britain. So do you agree with Daryl Cooper? Was he the chief villain of the Second World War? No, it's nonsense, isn't it? I mean, it's absolute historical nonsense. What is true, what is absolutely true, is that Britain was the biggest loser of World War II you know, in, in the peacetime that came afterwards. You know, we weren't bombed to destruction the way that Germany was. We weren't, you know, we didn't have our people massacred uh, in quite the same, civilians in quite the same way, although 60,000 were killed in the bombing. Uh, no, we came out bankrupt. Uh, we came out bankrupt. Uh, we came out having, lo we came out losing an empire. And we did it all to protect the freedom of Europe. So I think if you look through history, it's one of the most extraordinary, selfless things that we did. I suppose Churchill could have listened to Halifax and others and, and, and done a deal with Hitler. He could have done that, but he chose not to, which is a very good thing. Cooper makes the argument that Poland, in the end, uh, was under Soviet rule, you know, Stalin took over much of Eastern Europe. So actually this idea that, you know, we went to war to defend Poland's freedom, mm. um, you know, that outcome was t terrible for Poland and therefore the whole thing was a waste of time. <laughs> uh, well, you know, France was still free uh, and it wouldn't have been. And, you know, remember that France fell in 18 days, you know, for four and a half years, France and her allies resisted in World War One. And if the Germans had taken the whole of Europe, what next? What next? No, no, no. I don't think there's any doubt, certainly not in my mind, that the stand that Churchill took in 1940 may not have been a rational one, but it was the right one. One question I've asked of a lot of Tory politicians is who is their favourite Tory leader other than Thatcher and Churchill? I'm going to ask you the same question. Maybe Prime Minister might works better for you, but who is your favourite Prime Minister other than Thatcher and Churchill? Oh, I'm just not going to name anybody. No point. No point. You name a favourite song, your favourite book, you get ridiculed for years. Not playing You're not a Disraeli. You're just, not a Salisbury just, man. Just not playing that game. You're not a Stanley no, Baldwin type. No, I won't be answering any questions <laughs> in the future. No, it's, honestly, it's pointless because it gets dragged back up. You know, who do you admire most? Who do you loathe most? Not playing. What about, that's, that's a shame. Um, what about Enoch Powell? I want to ask about him as well. I've been asking, again, Liz Truss and yeah. people like that about his legacy. You know, he's a very important conservative politician after uh, the Second World War. Mm. He has a massive legacy. Um, do you admire Enoch Powell? Oh, intellectually, how could you not? Uh, I mean, you know, the youngest, the youngest professor in the British Empire, the youngest brigadier in the British Army in World War II. I mean, intellectually, an extraordinary man. Uh, Maybe not a very good politician. Maybe not a very good politician at all. I mean, you know, he he very easily could have become leader of the Conservative Party. Yeah, Mrs. Thatcher became the leader of the party in 75. It, it, it really should have been him, but he blew it. He blew it. He was in a hurry. He made a speech that was unwise, uh, uh, and it lived with him for the rest of it for, for the rest of his career. I want to ask about the current Tory leadership contenders. Mm. They all say that they can bring back reform voters mm. in the next election. What do you say to that? I can't even remember their names. Who are they? They're complete nobodies. Complete nobodies. They have no idea how loathed they are by people that have come to reform for their total betrayal of everything that was promised in the 2019 manifesto. No idea. Which one of, the, of them are you most worried about? Is it Generic? Is it, is it Kemi? Couldn't care less. Couldn't care less. They're all nobodies. They're, they're complete nobodies. And, and what everyone's, forget, what, everyone's forgetting something here. It doesn't matter a damn who the next Tory leader is. The brand is broken. The Conservative brand is done for. And just finally, if reform did win in 2029, you know, this huge change in British politics, how would you try and implement your policies? I think that it's fair to say the Conservative government have had issues with the civil service, oh, yeah. you know, and that's partly to blame on the ministers themselves. But how would you deal with this issue that Dominic Cummings raises a lot, that actually Whitehall is broken, the system is broken? Yeah, I mean, I think Cummings is right about this. I think his, his, um, his term, the blob, you know, to describe what's happening in Whitehall and within the education system, I think, I think he's really onto something there. I have no doubt there would be the most tremendous battles tremendous battles, just as there were tremendous battles in the 1980s, 
you know, a lot of the big Thatcher reforms, you know, she had the entire establishment against her. But if you have resolute, you have to have resolute leaders, but you also have to have a parliamentary party that supports you. That's why Liz Truss fell. You know, now, you know, they may have been doing all the wrong things too quick, maybe the right things too quickly. Um, if she'd had the rock solid support of her party, uh, she'd have stayed, but she didn't. So you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have, you know, 300 and something MPs who, who are there for the right reasons and who genuinely believe in the promises they've made to the electorate. But it's more than leadership, isn't it? It's about reforming the civil service, making sure it's meant to be impartial. Obviously, oh, not, it's sure. Not I mean, Blair ruined all that. You know, I mean, you could argue that Gladstone gave us a very independent, sort of incorruptible civil service and that Blair destroyed it. Absolutely destroyed it. Politicised everything. Look, none of this is going to be easy. You know, turning our country around is not going to be easy, but we have to try.